Why are catapults limited to aircraft carriers only? This could be used to reduce the runway lengths of airports and save on aircraft fuel. 1. Ted Maybury, Answers Assuming the question does not necessarily indicate the same catapult power experienced on a carrier, just something to assist the jet to come up to take off speed without burning a ton of its own fuel, I can see the validity of the question. However, 1. Cats take a lot of maintenance. It's not unusual for these to break down and be taken out of service for repairs, or maintenance, but maintenance wouldn't be scheduled during flight ops. In fact, carriers have four cats so even if one or two fail, they are still operational. I believe that's the current hang-up for the steam cat replacement, the M-Drive, they are failing too often and are impacting mission operationability. They work, they just need to improve reliability. 2. Cats for conventional airports would be expensive to design, install and maintain. Carriers these days rely on nuke power, bottom line, it takes a lot of energy to build up the required amount of steam to power. 3. Cats require access for maintenance, and possibly operation. Carrier decks are accessible from the bottom. Airports lay concrete, or asphalt or whatever material, on ground. The runway would get a lot more expensive if it has to support itself over a tunnel system necessary to maintain and operate a CAT system. 4. The CAT would have to be a lot longer than a carrier to soften the G's experienced by the plane. As already mentioned, commercial planes aren't built for such abuse. A longer CAT means a hell of a lot more steam, as you increase the length of the CAT the volume of steam required increases by pi r2. Hypothetically, you can design a cat to bring the plane to takeoff speed without spinning up the jet engines until the end of takeoff. But that means a really long cat and a hell of a lot of steam. 5. I could rehash other answers in this thread, like how commercial jets need to be ruggedized to handle the power of the cat or how passengers may not be able to handle the acceleration, but I won't and will stop here. Except to tell you my story of launching off on a COD, carrier on-board detachment. The aircraft is generally an C-2 Greyhound without the radar suite, the plane that looks like it's carrying a frisbee on the back. These planes are gutted and fitted with seats for passengers, with some room for cargo. Generally, the purpose of the CODs are to carry people and mail back and forth to shore. It's not a jet aircraft but a turboprop that can still pull some surprising G's, as experienced on multiple wave-offs while trying to land, I got to experience that too. So, this is my first time CODing off a carrier. It's summertime, and hot. I don't know if these CODs have much in climate control, they have to have some, but sitting on a carrier deck on a hot summer day waiting to be taxied to the cat, well, we sat there for probably over an hour sweating ourselves to death. One thing most people don't know is the passenger seats are mounted backwards, facing the rear of the cabin. Makes sense, if you crash, your body will be thrown to the back of the seat rather than being ejected out of the seat. I think more people would survive commercial flights this way, but lots of people would have trouble flying facing aft. We all had to wear safety gear which included life preserver, inflatable, with other built-in gadgets like strobe lights, so they can find your carcass floating in the ocean at night, as well as a helmet with ear covers to protect your hearing, it's quite loud out there. Once seated, you have to buckle up with a four-point seat belt, across the lap and over the shoulders all hooked into a single catch, receiver device that holds all four belts tight, remember this part. We had the pre-brief inside the skin of the carrier, two junior officers will yell as loud as they can and wave their hands, because you still can't hear them yell once inside on a noisy aircraft all spun up ready to take off, as soon as they expect the cat to release. By the way, two more points. They told me to take off my glasses because the force of takeoff will remove the glasses for me. I didn't believe them, besides, my glasses fit pretty tight. Also, I was in the last row, so I was facing a bunch of empty space at the end of the cabin. I had no row of seats in front of me to brace myself against. 
so, a little over an hour in waiting for the takeoff, I notice my glasses fitting a little looser. That happens when I sweat for an hour. I decide what the heck, I can remove the glasses, just in case. So, I pack my glasses away securely and reach up to wipe some sweat off my forehead. I let my hand drop. It falls on the release for the four-point seat belt. I look down as all four belts flop away off my waist. Within two seconds, the two junior officers start waving their hands. Oh. Shit. We are about to take off. I scramble big time, plug each belt buckle back into the receptacle, probably established some kind of record. I barely have time to grab the shoulder harnesses, as trained during pre-flight, and don't even have time to tighten the upper straps of my harness when that cat let loose. Holy. Shit. My legs, not secured by any harness or restrained by a row of seats in front of me stick out straight in front of me. No part of my back is touching the back of my seat. There is one hell of a pull on that plane, my head is bent forward and I don't even try to bring it back to the vertical position. The strangest thing is this sensation went on for about 5 minutes. Okay, so it was probably 3 seconds, but wow, that was a long 3 seconds. Why that front landing gear didn't get ripped right off the aircraft and just get tossed into the sea was beyond me. I immediately gained a serious appreciation for the engineering that holds that aircraft together. So, three seconds later, my legs still holding position hanging straight out in front of me and my head bent forward in a locked position, and yes, my glasses would have flown off, the plane reaches the end of the deck and bam, we start dropping. So, no longer is it only my back that isn't touching the seat, now my ass seems to be floating off the cushion too. This part only lasts a second or two before the plane starts its climb and it starts pretending to be a regular flight. Now, if I didn't get my harness reconnected in time and I was in any other row with a seat in front of me, I would have been crumpled up against the seat in front of me through takeoff, but survived just fine. But since I was in the last row with several yards between me and the rear bulkhead, well, I would have definitely retained some significant level of injury. This is why commercial aircraft will never be catapulted in anywhere near the same manner or force as a carrier. 2. Jim Mayoreader Answers Naval air stations, which are on land, don't have catapults or arresting cables. If today's training schedule involves practicing retinal detachment, they have to fly out to an aircraft carrier. That the people who have the right kind of planes for catapult operation don't use catapults on land says a lot. Besides all the other good answers, what else can I think of? Problem 1, building a catapult is far more expensive than building a runway and you'd need a lot more land to launch planes by catapult because you need extra catapults for the frequent times they fail. Problem 2, it requires more fuel to make a catapult takeoff than a standard one. Airliner pilots do the rated takeoffs these days. The pilot calculates the plane's weight then computes the minimum amount of power needed to safely depart. And that's all the gas he gives the plane. It saves fuel and saves wear on the engines. Cat shots require full military power, throttle wide open, unless the plane is carrying a combat load, and then they use afterburners. Problem 2A, even under the rated takeoff regimes airports have big problems with noise abatement, which you wouldn't be able to do if you had to launch every airplane at full throttle. Problem 3, airports would have to hire more people. Watch the movie Top Gun. Ignore the bad acting unrealistic plot and that messers. McCoyan and Gurevich seem to have gotten a good deal on low mileage F5S and watch the carrier opstant which were shot on a real CVN with genuine sailors and naval aircraft. Notice how many people it takes to launch a plane from a carrier. It would take at least that many people to launch airliners with a catapult. Problem 4, every plane would have to be weighed on a multi-million dollar scale so the cat operator knows how high to set the steam pressure. Problem 5, if a cat on an aircraft carrier doesn't throw the plane hard enough, it crashes into the ocean. If a cat at an airport doesn't throw it hard enough, 
it crashes into that new, and full, 350-room hotel on the airport property. Problem 6, it would slow the airport down to use catapults, or the airport would have to get bigger. O'Hare does, on average, one takeoff or landing per minute. A plane that leaves O'Hare pulls onto the departure runway, sets its throttles to take off power and releases the brakes. A plane that leaves an aircraft carrier sits there for several minutes while they're connecting it to the catapult. So dot if it takes a minute and a half to launch a plane using a runway versus six minutes to launch one off a cat, you'd have to either cut the amount of air traffic going out of an airport by three quarters, or build 4x as many cats as they have runways. Also remember, no one's going to spend as much to rebuild a plane to handle cat takeoffs as they spent to buy it, so the only people who could use the cats would be the ones with new planes. You'd still need traditional runways for them, and in the present day. All in all, it's not a real great solution. 3. Chris Liu, a modern commercial airline cannot take the stress that a catapult would exert on the fuselage. The nose gear and forward fuselage in particular would have to be strengthened. In any event, if you had a situation where the airfield's runway was so short that the aircraft would not be able to take off, landing the aircraft on said runway would be a problem too. That would necessitate resting gear, which again commercial airlines do not have the ability to take. A tail hook is needed anyways on the catapult, to stop it in emergencies. Katabar operations from military aircraft carriers also have huge G-loads. We're talking on the order of 5 to 7 G's here. I think that while children and younger adults might find that quite a thrill, that would be dangerous to certain members of the flying public. These include the elderly, the ill, pregnant women, and others who are not at the peak of health. I wonder if G-suits would become mandatory in such a situation lest people lose consciousness. Catapult pilots on military aircraft go through some very stringent physical checks too, something not all of the flying public will have a chance of passing. Landing on an aircraft carrier, by the way, is one of the most difficult tasks in aviation, so it would make the pilot's job a lot harder. These huge G-loads would also shorten the life of the fuselage and could introduce another safety risk. It's one thing if a wire snaps when a fighter aircraft lands on a carrier. The pilot can eject. It is another if on landing a commercial jet with hundreds of people on board snaps a cable. The safety record of the catapult would have to be perfect or people simply won't fly on a catapulted aircraft. There would also have to be the matter of maintaining the catapult. That is an expensive, complex piece of equipment too. You would need a huge catapult too to accelerate an A380 sized aircraft. As you can see there are many disadvantages. They would exceed any savings in fuel in smaller airports, longer runways by the way provide a margin of safety too. Aircraft carriers use them because they have no choice. Civil aviation is designed for safety and low operating costs, with comfort in business and first class also added in. Maybe someday? Airbus has said it might happen, in 2050. All of these problems will have to be solved though for it to happen, and it has to be economical.